What's up, Define Nick? Welcome to another episode of Define Your Health with Danielle Giordano. Strength through knowledge. And you know, knowledge can be such a powerful thing. And today we're going to be talking about a very, very serious topic with a very special guest uh, all the way in Rhode Island. We're going to be talking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease in general. And um, it's an amazingly devastating disease, not just for the person who has it, who uh, slowly has their life slip from them, but also their families uh, and, and how it is impactful to see your loved one slip away little by little. And this disease has been gaining uh, the, the, the cases that have been diagnosed in the past 20 years or so, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about preventable steps that you can take. Uh, because, you know, it used to be that Alzheimer's was a death sentence. It used to be kind of like cancer. If someone told you you had Alzheimer's, oh my goodness, it was over. There was nothing you could do, uh, which we're finding out through new research is uh, false. And that is not something we should be waving the white flag at. So our guest today, I want to introduce... Um, I, I, I am so proud of this organization, the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation. I am extremely proud to sit on their board of directors. And I am so, so proud to have this wonderful woman on my show today. Marie Las Caritas, uh, I hope you're keeping warm all the way up there in Rhode Island. And thank you, thank you so much for uh, being on our show today. Thank you, Danielle, for inviting me. Uh, it's freezing here. It's about <laughs> one degree. <laughs> oh, one degree. We're in we're in Dallas, and it's about fifty, and we're all complaining down here. One degree. Oh, burr. So, um, Marie, you. you know, you have built such a tremendous organization uh, over the past several years, and you know, again, I, I'm so proud to sit on the board of directors and and to help out uh, with this disease because it impacted my family personally. Um, I've seen the effects of it. Uh, I've seen the you know the effects it has on the person. And obviously the family, I'm cognizant that it's something that I'm at risk for. Can you fill the listeners in on exactly how did you become involved in the organization? How did you start it? What prompted it? What, what's a little bit of your backstory, specifically with your parents, I do believe, and, and your father uh, to begin with? Yes. Um, back in 1999, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. As you know, it's one of these diseases that, excuse me, takes a big toll on the family. And also, you know, it's a, it, people back then felt that it was a death sentence. And people still do feel that way today. Mm -hmm. But um, after several years of crying and banging my head against the wall, I decided that I was going to roll up my sleeves and become proactive. And on March 23rd, 2005, 10 years next month, um, I decided I was going to do something that has never before been attempted in medical history. And so I founded the Alzheimer's Cure, C-U-R-E. I'm spelling it out because many times I say the word cure and people think it's care, C-A-R-E. Mm -hmm. So it's the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation. Um, and our goal is to dramatically accelerate the cure for this devastating disease. When I, when I got involved with the organization. When I founded the organization, my personal hope was that my dad would live to benefit from it. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, he passed away in 2008, October 2nd, 2008. Worse still, my mother, who was diagnosed back in the year 2000 with Parkinson's disease these past couple of years, has also um, developed dementia. Um, I'm her caregiver and I get to see it once again up close and personal. And it's a devastating, devastating disease. Well, and, and, you know, really spoken like a true leader, Marie, you know, you saw something that needed to be done. And instead of sitting on the sidelines and being helpless, you, you know, to quote you, you rolled up your sleeves and, you know, you jumped in and you wanted to make a difference uh, for, if not your father, for other fathers, for other families that are out there. Uh, and I just, I, I applaud you for your courage and your determination and really your innovative thinking. Uh, and we're going to get more into exactly what the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation does and a little bit more about this disease in our next segment. So Defy Nation, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Ooh. 
Hi, this is Christy Rains, founder and president of Alpha Omega Consulting and Bookkeeping. Let us help you with getting your books prepared for your end. You can reach me by phone at 972-743-0602 or visit my website at aobookkeeping.com. We help our clients make sense of their sense. aobookkeeping.com Your marriage may be over, but your life doesn't have to be. Find us at divastogether.com and Divas is divorcing, independent, very able survivors. DivasTogether.com Welcome back to Fine Nation. And we are here with Marie from the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation out of Rhode Island, although it is a national organization. And we're talking about a pretty serious subject here today. We're talking about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which is a terribly, terribly devastating disease for so many thousands of families uh, across the United States and across the world. Uh, And we just got done hearing how Marie rolled up her sleeves and got involved and really what her driving passion is and really the leadership that she's established in uh, the Alzheimer's community and the work that she is trying to do. So Marie, let's, let's really dig into some of the statistics here. Um, You know, we all kind of categorize Alzheimer's disease um, is, you know, the forgetful or it's an older person's disease or, you know, there's certain stereotypes that might go with it. But what are some statistics that you would specifically, you know, w- really that folks should know, uh, not just the general ones that you can, you know, Google? <laughs> um, well, the breakdown of the statistics is basically as follows. One in eight 65-year-olds has Alzheimer's disease in the United States. And it, uh, the uh, the percentages increase as you get older. By the time someone is is somewhere between 80 and 85, it's three out of five individuals. So that's 60 percent of all 80 to 85 year olds have or will get Alzheimer's. So that's a huge number. But I think that what is what is mostly unknown to the public. And maybe the new movie that is, that just came out is going to bring light to that. And that movie you're referring many, is 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 that still Alice? Still Alice, yes, still Alice. Um, there are many individuals as young as thirty, and maybe even younger, sometimes even younger, that have Alzheimer's. I think, mm-hmm. um, generally speaking, the number is around three hundred thousand Americans have early onset Alzheimer's disease. And when we say early onset Alzheimer's disease, many times people confuse that with early stage. They want to say early stage and they say early onset. Early onset um, refers to the age that the disease started, the onset of the disease. It doesn't refer to the stage. It's two different things. And many times people um, confuse those two, those two terms. Um, back in the year 2011, I was really very, very heartbroken. Um, August of 2011, I went to the wake of a young man who had passed at the age of 40. Mm. He was he was the third child of a poor woman who buried three children, all three of them diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 30. And died by the time they were forty. Oh, it and that and that is just amazingly heartbreaking. Um, and you know, it, there's a lot of studies out there that are pointing to things like aspartame and pointing to things like you know heavy metals in the air and the foods that we eat. And you know, of course, the GMO topic comes up. And and you know, and I really do want to call attention to this: the fact that Alzheimer's disease isn't just a 70, 80 year old disease now. Uh, you know, it really is folks that are, are in their 30s and their 40s that are contracting this terrible disease. Uh, and, and the correlations between, you know, our environment, what we're eating and what we're doing. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. It really is. It is. It is. And um, I think we need to pay more attention, <laughs> excuse me, more attention to a lot of things. Um, there are a lot of individuals who don't want to get a flu shot or another vaccine because of the mercury content 
And, I, and I'm actually one of those people, Marie. I haven't gotten a flu right. shot, and I can't tell you how many years. The same here. The same with me. I haven't gotten a flu shot in a long, long time. Um, but now I realize that you can get a flu shot. Just make sure when you go to the pharmacy that it's an individual dose flu shot that doesn't have thimerosal. You can ask for a flu shot that doesn't have thimerosal. Thimerosal is the mercury content in the flu shot. Um, this year I did get a flu shot, and of course, without thimerosal. And th I've been insisting on the same thing for my mother. I, I insist that she gets one every single year, but I also insist that she gets one that's thimerosal free. So that's something that your audience might want to uh, embrace in their own life. No, absolutely, and I and I think that's a valid point for those folks who do still want to get a flu shot. Um, you know, you know, knowing what is in there, and that kind of goes back to knowing what you're putting in your body, for better or for worse. What are you putting into your body? So that's an excellent, excellent point, Marie, and I, I applaud you for bringing it up. Um, I do have to say, I think I'll still pass on the flu shot, but I think it's great for, for, you know, those people who do still want to get it, that they know what to avoid, or they know that even that they can ask for it. Speaking up, uh, really is, is kind of half of the equation, you know, knowing what to ask for and then actually speaking up is the other half. So, you know, and, and again, I briefly touched on, you know, I had Alzheimer's affect my family and dementia affect my family. But you work with so many families and you have seen so many cases. You know, can you take, you know, just a couple minutes here and, and really take us through what Alzheimer's is like, what you have seen, uh, specifically for the families, uh, and then secondarily for the person actually going through it, um, going through the disease and, and the emotional side to it, the physical aspects of it. Uh, and then lastly, you know, you, you know, a lot of people when they hear someone's died of Alzheimer's, they don't understand exactly how you can die from Alzheimer's. And so if you want to take the first half of my question first, uh, that would be appreciated. Yeah, and it's a wonderful question. Uh, you know, a, a few years back, a woman had communicated with me who had Alzheimer's. And um, one of the questions that I asked her is, how, what does it feel like? Because she seemed to be... Um, in the very early stages, so she was able to communicate very, very um, fluently and, and without hesitation all her emotions. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, I said, what is it like to have Alzheimer's? And she said to me, you know, Marie, the best way I can describe it is that you're in an ocean full of water, and the water is so filthy that you can't see through it. And mm -hmm. I remember that I got goosebumps in my throughout my entire body. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was such such a way of describing it that I never thought of it in those terms. Um, I think that one of the major issues is that it's so frustrating for the caregivers. And I've been a caregiver, uh, a part time caregiver for my father. My mother was a major caregiver but now a full-time caregiver for my mother. And I can see how it can be so frustrating for, for the caregivers who, who care for Alzheimer's patients. If it can be frustrating for me, even though I know what she's going through mm -hmm. and what to expect, can you imagine what someone else who, who doesn't have that knowledge feels like? Oh, I, I'm, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and that's the, so many, uh, caregivers across country, they find themselves in that position. They're overwhelmed. It's not that they do not love. It's not that they're not trying to understand. It's, you're dealing with something that is very difficult to wrap your mind around because, you know, we don't have an explanation for it yet. Um, and it, it can be incredibly, incredibly frustrating. And Marie, I want to dive into the actual how someone actually um, dies of Alzheimer's because that's a very confusing subject matter for a lot of people because it's like well how do you die sure. of memory loss that doesn't yeah. make sense right after well, this don't. break we are going to get right. into that Define Nation you okay. stay tuned we're going to cut, cut away to Chef Vivian James in the cooking corner right now but we'll be right back so what's chayote squash well I don't know if you've seen them in the store but they're a pear shaped 
vegetable that um, originated in Mexico but can be found throughout the world if you know where to look for it. Um, get it in your farmer's market or at your local grocery store. And depending on where you live, chayote may be called a vegetable pear or chocho or cristofine. Its flavor is described as a cross between a turnip, cucumber, and a zucchini. To me, it really doesn't have as much flavor. However, it's very versatile. You can steam it, bake it, stuff it, or fry it. Um, you want to make sure that when you purchase it, you get a good quality one, one that's firm, unblemished, light to medium green in color. And the skin can be either smooth or rough. Just avoid it if it's blemished with dark brown spots. Chayote squash is available year-round, picking September through May. Um, it has protein and loaded with fiber. So grab yourself a chayote squash today and have some fun with it. And we are back, Define Nation. And again, we are talking with Marie from the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation. And we're talking about the very, very serious subject of Alzheimer's and dementia. And Marie, I want to go straight into um, the actual death of Alzheimer's. And, and when people say that they um, have had a loved one die of Alzheimer's, a lot of times that's very confusing to people. Because how do you die of memory loss? A lot of people just don't understand that. Uh, and although it, it's much more complicated from that, I'd like you to take the lead on this one and really explain to our listeners, when somebody dies of Alzheimer's, how exactly do they die of Alzheimer's? That's an excellent question, Danielle. It really is. Um, you don't die from Alzheimer's. You die from the complications of Alzheimer's. So, for example, one of the most common complications is aspiration pneumonia. As mm -hmm. you know, Alzheimer's affects the brain. Yes. So when the brain is affected, the whole body, in effect, is affected. Um, in the later stages, the Alzheimer's patient can't talk, um, has no control of their bowels, can't walk in many cases. Um, it's a total breakdown of the body. And mm -hmm. one of the areas that is very much affected is the swallowing. Um, so when an Alzheimer's patient, especially in the middle and later stages, um, swallows many times, instead of it going, you know, down the esophagus, it goes through the, the windpipe. Mm -hmm. And that can cause aspiration pneumonia. One of the things that's very, very important, and unfortunately, I learned about it the hard way because that's the way my father died, um, is that there are tests that, that you can do. You can ask your neurologist, and anyone who has Alzheimer's should be, should be seen by a neurologist. I've heard by all too many patients saying, oh, my primary care doctor is the one who takes care of my mom, my dad, my husband, my wife, whoever. Well, it shouldn't be. It should be a neurologist. Um, you should, you can ask your neurologist to, um, to write a prescription for them to have, um, a modified, what do they call it? M modified barium swallow. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And also to be seen by a speech therapist. There are exercises that can be done in order to try to correct a problem in swallowing. Well, and many people do not realize that things like coughing or swallowing are not involuntary actions. You know, many times even people who have had uh, some sort of brain trauma, they have to relearn how to cough or how to swallow or, or those type right. of things. And so that makes complete sense if someone um, does not remember how to swallow, right. uh, how they can die of aspiration. And, and, and that's, and that's an excellent right. point. And, and you bring up exercise and, and you know, Marie, um, you know, I did a webinar series for the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation, and one of the things that we specifically talked about is exercise, and really exercise twofold, um, and that is aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise. And, you know, to break down a very, very complicated webinar, which I would encourage people to go to the Define YouTube uh, channel or to seek out the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation where you'll be able to find these webinars, you know, we talked much more in depth about each one, but, you know, a, a very simplistic view is, well, if you have, you know, cardiovascular exercise, then you're supplying the brain with more oxygen. 
that's basically the long and short of it. There's also something in the circulatory system called the endothelium. And the endothelium is responsible for nitric oxide in the blood. The healthier that endothelium is, the more oxygen rich and basically the healthier the blood is. And the blood is supplying the oxygen to the brain. So aerobic exercise twofold helps both the endothelial and the circulatory system as well as actually getting oxygen to the brain. Uh, the more that you can get oxygen to the brain, the more that you can support the healthy tissue that is uh, in the brain. Now, transversely with the anaerobic exercise, you know, anaerobic exercise, you know, most people think of, oh, well, you know, the beach bodies, you know, have, have you ever heard that, Marie, the beach bodies, you know, the guys on the beach? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's not what we're talking about here. You know, you know, basically the central nervous system talking about the spine and the brain, you know, connects and sends signals, you know, to the muscles through these things called motor units. And the more motor units that you have, the more muscle tissue you have, or the more muscle tissue you create, the more motor units the body has to have. Well, the more motor units there are, the more signals are being sent back and forth between the brain uh, and the spine and the um, spinal cord and these motor units. Now, the benefit to that, specifically to the brain, is the more pathways that you can create in the brain because of these motor units and the increased signaling, the more you can keep that tissue alive, the more that tissue stays vital, and the more new pathways that you can create in the brain protecting that brain matter. And, you know, we're not going to get into white and gray matter here on today's show, um, but... I mean, you know, what are your thoughts, you know, specifically on that, Marie, or exercise in general? Well, I can't stress the importance of exercise enough. Uh, it's been shown that people who walk, uh, I believe it's six miles a week, um, have a decreased risk of developing Alzheimer's. Yep. And I think that even, even if someone does have Alzheimer's, exercise can only help. It's been shown that exercise is really one of the main ways that someone can reverse some of the damage of Alzheimer's. But when I was referring to exercise in relation to aspiration pneumonia, there are specific exercises that have nothing to do with aerobic or anaerobic. There are specific speech-related uh, exercises. Um, my mother, for example, knowing now what I what I know about, you know, aspiration pneumonia, I had her seen by a speech uh, therapist, and he actually did some voice exercises with her, having her repeat loudly some of the vowels and various other things that I would have to show you, um, you know, live as opposed to <laughs> trying to describe them. But exercise in general, you're absolutely right. It's the oxygen. It's the oxygen that goes to the brain, etc. You talked, you brought up a very important issue, um, creating new pathways in the brain. And can I say a couple of things regarding that? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, they found that individuals who are bilingual have more pathways or different pathways than people who only speak one language. Makes sense. So if you, so if you are a loved one, um, is if one of you is bilingual, actually the, the loved one who has Alzheimer's, the best thing you can do is make sure, and usually what happens with Alzheimer's with bilingual individuals, they usually revert to the language they knew first, their, their native language. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a good idea, let's say their native language is Italian. I think it's a good idea to continue speaking to them in English because even if they respond to you in Italian, they have to use their brain yes. to realize and to notice and 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 to you know uh, be cognizant of what you're ta you're telling them, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good idea if a loved one is bilingual to make sure that even if they speak to you in their native language. Mm -hmm speak to them in English, or if they speak in English and you know that they they also speak Italian, try to draw out the Italian language from them. Yeah, and, and, and that, and that is an excellent point, and I, we're, we're almost running out of time here, Marie. 
I'm sorry. I want to make sure that people know where they can find the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation and where they can reach out to you. Um, website, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that. Can you go ahead and tell folks how to get a hold of you? Uh, yes. First of all, my phone number, um, which is area code 401-473-7000. One nine. Our website is A L Z as in zebra, C as in Charlie, U R E dot org. And let me just say one thing. Yes, we are located in uh, Rhode Island, but we don't we don't offer any more services in Rhode Island than we do in Texas, in California, in the state of Washington. And most of our donors are out-of-state donors. And it is um, amazing also, work that you do all across the country. It absolutely is. And uh, one of the things that we have on our website is our uh, virtual wall of remembrance. So when someone makes us their, uh, their organization of choice in lieu of flowers, and I hope all your loved ones live forever, but when that happens, they automatically get to put their... Uh, their loved ones, their names, date of birth, date of passing on our wall of remembrance. Uh, they can also do that by uh, a certain donation. They'll find inf information on our website on how else to get their loved one's name on there. And our goal, um, as Danielle knows, is to dramatically accelerate the cure for Alzheimer's disease. We want to raise and award a $20 million cash prize that will serve as the gold medal for the scientists or a team of scientists who discover the cure for Alzheimer's. Well, and it's like also should has be, never been done. And it should also be noted too that 100% of the donations go specifically to uh, the foundation, correct? I mean, there is no kind of, I hate to say waste, but you know, some nonprofits have a little bit of fringe on the outside and that is not the case with the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation, correct? Every single penny that comes in goes directly towards this cause. Every single penny, and uh, not only that, but we're one of the very, very few organizations. Not only in Alzheimer's, I don't, I don't believe there are any organizations in the area of Alzheimer's that don't have any paid employees. But we have absolutely no paid employees, and that includes myself. All right. Well, we are going to have to wrap up. Marie, again, I thank you and I applaud you for your leadership, for your determination, for your dedication and your devotion to help others. Defy Nation, this is your call to action. Go and check out the Alzheimer's Cure Foundation. Check their website, their Facebook Check out those YouTube webinars that we have up on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to www.defineyourhealth.com, you just click on the YouTube. All of them are listed on there. We encourage you to go. Um, there is something you can do if diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It is not a sentence. There is hope. You just have to know where that hope lies. So, Marie, thank you, thank you again. And uh, Define Nation, don't you forget, we have that $500 prize pack that we are going to be giving away f with a question from this interview. We will be posting that on the Facebook page. And so make sure you keep your ears open. We'd love to thank our sponsors, Kind Bar, Soy Joy, and our friends at Nordic Naturals. Oh, I love Nordic Naturals. Our friends at Zevia, non-aspartame, no-calorie soda and of course the alzheimer's cure foundation themselves marie thank you so much again defy nation remember stay motivated dedicated and highly recommended bye-bye